Welcome. I'm Lori Fahey, President and CEO of the Family Cafe, and I'm delighted that you have chosen to join us today for our Facebook Live event for the 22nd Annual Family Cafe. We are hosting these events every day between now and June 19th, except for Sunday, both at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. We will, we will have these sessions um, presented to you live on Facebook. And I really hope that you enjoy these presentations. I would now like to turn this over to Jeremy Countryman, who will give you some housekeeping items before introducing our uh, this morning's keynote. Jeremy. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Uh, you, hopefully you remember me from last week if you all were here. I'm Jeremy Countryman. I'm the program director here at the Family Cafe. As Lori mentioned, we're getting back to it with daily sessions at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. on Facebook Live. Uh, that'll run this week all the way through Saturday, and then again next week, Monday through Friday, June 19th. Uh, before we begin, a couple things I want to remind you of. First of all, we do have a smartphone app. If you haven't downloaded it yet, I would encourage you to do so. It's a good way to keep up with what's going on and uh, a good way to select those sessions ahead of time that you make sure you want to tune in for. If you do miss any of the sessions, they're all available in the video section of our Facebook page. We got two excellent sessions today. This morning, we're gonna be talking about uh, exceptional student education, a uh, big issue with our families, and I'm sure something you all wanna have uh, a lot of information about. And then this afternoon, we're gonna be concentrating on voting. So please do come back at two o'clock for that. Before I turn it over to our panelists, I just wanna let you know that uh, we are trying to make things as interactive as possible. So if you do have questions or comments, you can go ahead and enter those into the comment thread right there on Facebook. Um, I know our panelists are planning on covering some of the most common issues in special education and have some of the most common questions lined up to discuss. So we'll try to cover all those. And then hopefully at the end of the hour, we'll have some time to get to your questions as well. So with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and welcome the moderator for this morning's special education panel, and that is Joe LaBelle from FND. So I'll pass it over to Joe. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Lori. Um, we are thrilled to be here today and to provide what we hope is going to be an engaging conversation on special education topics and questions from around the state. Um, my name is Joe LaBelle. I'm the Director of Programs at Family Network on Disabilities. Family Network on Disabilities is the statewide parent training information center funded by OSEP. And we are thrilled to be joined by um, Ann Siegel um, from Disability Rights. We're thrilled to be here, uh, be joined by Vicki um, Galantinas and Ali Walford. Um, so, uh, Anne, Vicki, and Allie, do you want to just introduce yourselves for a brief moment? Good morning. I'm Ann Siegel. I'm the Director of Advocacy, Education, and Outreach with Disability Rights Florida. Disability Rights Florida is the state's protection and advocacy agency. Good morning, everybody. This is Victoria Gitanis. Uh, I am the Senior Director at the Florida Department of Education for dispute resolution and monitoring. Good morning, everyone. My name is Allie Walford, and I am the program director for PEN, which is the Parent Education Network. We are the Parent Training Information Center that serves the 10 southernmost counties here in Florida. And um, I have two children um, that I've garnered this experience with that I'll be sharing with you today. So my first question is going to be going to Ann Siegel. Um, Ann, the question is, if my child is positive for COVID-19, will the school tell everyone what are our privacy rights? Okay, great question. And I know that's something that's on a lot of parents' minds right now. So no, they will not be able to tell everyone under FERPA, which is the Family Education Rights Privacy Act, um, it's a federal law that protects the privacy of students' educational records. So this law does apply to all public and private schools, and therefore the schools cannot give out personal identifying information about your child. So they're not going to say 
that John Doe is a student in your class who's tested positive for COVID-19. What the school can do is send an alert out that there was a student that had tested positive and that they're advising families to get their children tested because they may have been exposed, but they cannot give out any personal identifying information. The only entity that they could possibly do that would be to the health department. And that would be obviously because it is a public safety concern, but the, the health department is not in turn going to publish this and let everyone know. That will be handled confidentially and discreetly. Perfect. And let me ask a follow up question. Um, do, do, are families obligated to tell schools if their child was tested, has tested positive? Well, I think, Honestly, um, if your child has tested positive and they are currently, um, they should not be in school. So you don't want to have, a, you know, most school districts have that whole, um, if your child's had a temperature within the last 24 hours, please keep them home. So we are, you know, obviously advising families that if your child is sick, please let them remain home and in your care because we do not want to continue the spread of the virus. So um, no, no sending kids that are sick to school is, is kind of the, the rule of thumb there. And um, I would say that it's always best to let the school know about any special healthcare needs your child may have so that they're able to address that and be able to look for symptoms or whether there's med medication side effects and things like that. Perfect. Now, Vicki, the next question comes to you. Um, what happens to all of the hours of service and therapy that my child missed during the school closures? That's a very good question. Um, and it's prob I, I know it's probably on a lot of parents' minds right now. So uh, I think the first thing I wanna do is if you have concerns, that uh, your, your child is, is gonna be lagging behind in the fall or they're, they're, they've missed critical uh, services, I think the first thing that I would recommend parents do is to reach out to their schools and districts and start talking about a plan right now. So, um, and, the, and that plan can look a lot of different ways. Uh, we already have that capability for something called ex extended school year services, ESY services. And that's a conversation you can begin right now cooperatively with uh, your within IEP teams, parents and districts working together to try to figure out what we can do right now to help uh, uh, make a path forward that's going to be uh, mitigating some of those losses. Um, and um, and of course, it is a cooperative IEP team decision. So it's something that we should all sit down together and talk about. Great, great, thank you, Ali. The the next question is up for you. Um, how is a 504 plan different than an IEP? Well, thank you, Joe. Um, that's a question we get a lot here at the Parent Training Information Centers because we serve all families from birth until 22. Have they been identified? Haven't they been identified? My school says I should have a 504, but I think that I need an IEP. So that's a really great question. Um, when you hear the term 504 plan, I think it's important to know that that comes from um, the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. So that's one set of area. And then the IEP is actually from our Individuals with Disabilities Act, which, which was just a few years later. What I like to tell my parents, because I need to talk in broad terms with my parents, every single case is individual, just like Vicki said with the services. So you really need to stay in those broad buckets. And with the 504, it's those accommodations. How is the school going to help meet your child's needs by altering the um, environment or the access that they have to it? Um, the 504 is also much more uh, broader. It is any disability that impacts one or more um, life of, uh, activities that an individual may have. The IDEA and the IEP, it's, it's very specific. There's 13 categories in IDEA. They have specific eligibility criteria. And there's a, a very, I use the word specific a lot, process 
for um, acquiring that IEP. The parent signs consent, they do the evaluation, then you have the evaluator share that with the families. Um, so another way that the IEP and the 504 look differently is those team members. Um, but of course, you know, the parent I'm always going to have that parent point of view. So I may be the program director for Penn now, but I was a parent first. And that is where um, I think our expertise lies is in that lived experience as um, a parent. So again, those evaluations look a little bit differently. Um, both uh, areas are required to provide that child FAPE, that free and appropriate public education. With IDEA, that FAPE, again, is in the uh, idea of access ability. And then with ID IDEA, it's specialized services. What does my child need in order to um, have an educational benefit along with what they call their non-disabled peers, or me as my mom, I would just call them classmates. <laughs> um, and then there, if there is any uh, un things that you don't understand or conflicts that you're experiencing, again, I'm going to repeat what um, Vicki had said about working directly with your school and um, figuring out how can we have a, a collaborative solution to whatever plan is going to help drive your child's education. So that was a very, very brief overview of two really big concepts. But if uh, Vicki and Ann, if you have anything to add, I'm more than welcome to hear that. Sure. I think uh, an easy way to think about it is if uh, IDE eligibility, you're looking at uh, education and support and related services for the kid to, to access and make uh, you know, progress in the curriculum. In terms of 504, you're looking usually at the provision of accommodations for those for that access. Great. Now the the next question comes to um, comes to Anne, and the question is, what is RTI, and why does my school say they have to do RTI MTSS before I can have my child tested? for ESC services or an IEP? Okay, so RTI stands for Response to Intervention and in special education, we love to have our acronyms. So um, RTI is one of them. It is a process uh, based, it is not a program, it's not a classroom. Um, we get a lot of confusion on that when people reach out to us and ask us, you know, what is this whole RTI? First of all, it is a process for intervention where students are supposed to receive high quality research-based instruction in their general education setting. There are often times where there are students who are receiving RTI tier one and the family does not, is not even aware of that. Um, we would recommend, obviously to the school districts, that they have parents be an integral part of the process from tier one on so that they are participants in their child's educational planning. Um, I think that would also help uh, families with a lot less confusion when their child is struggling. So then they have continuous monitoring of the student's performance and all students are screened for academic. And if those are, um, you also could use RTI for any kind of behavioral um, concerns and problems. And then there's multiple levels of instruction that are progressively more intense. Like I said, a lot of the students are in tier one. And then if those interventions are not significant enough to make sure that child's making meaningful educational progress, then they would move on to tier two. And tier two would intensify um, the programming even more. And then by tier three, you're really at the, at the highest level of intensity and remediation. If a child is not making progress at tier three, then Houston, we have a problem. We should be looking at eligibility. One of the things that a lot of families that have um, concerns and have reached out to us have said that very question, I asked for my child to be evaluated and the school district came back and said, we're in the process of RTI and when we're done, we can look at evaluating. And that's actually incorrect. 
RTI can be done concurrently with evaluating your child. So there is an OSTEP letter, I believe it was January 21st of 2011, that's out there. You can Google it for your families and you need a copy of it. But it, it explains that RTI can be done concurrently with the evaluation process. The intent of RTI was not to delay evals. So the school district can do that. And the great part of having the RTI data is that can also be um, discussed at the eligibility meeting. So it works hand in hand, but it cannot delay. And there is a specific timeline that evaluations must occur. And so they need to do that evaluation process and have all of that data wrapped up. So um, I know we've got a lot of, it's kind of one of those things out there that there's a lot of myths about, but RTI is a pretty straightforward, research-based, data-driven process. And so when, when families have that concern, my, my recommendation would be to meet with your ESE uh, folks at the school and get everything resolved and signed for those consents so the timeline starts. I really appreciate you uh, you bringing up that OSEP letter. It's, um, you know, that's often something that we provide to families as um, they're just trying to help provide clarification. You know, we know that everyone is working with the best tools that they have and providing additional information both to districts, individual schools, and then to families um, is really the best way to help forge the path of communication. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, Allie, the next question comes to you, and it says, what do I do if a school only gives me a specific window of time for an IEP meeting, and I just can't make it? Um, that's a really good question. That's also a question we get a lot here at the Parent Training Information Centers. Um, what we do is we um, provide resources, information, and education to parents. And one of the biggest educations that we can provide is that you, as a parent, you're an integral member of that team. You are really, really, you're important. You are an important member of that team. And if you can't make that window, you can just flat out tell the school district, say, hey, that window is really not going to work for me. I know I'm an important member of this team. Can we please reschedule it to another time? Now, part of that collaborative process is to... Um, you know, even if you're experiencing frustration with the process to um, try and be as calm as you can with the school and give them alternatives, you know, hey, here's a morning slot, here's an afternoon slot, here's an evening slot, here's two different day slots. Um, and then as we've seen in the last 90 days, um, we've always had access to alternative means of participating in our children's meeting, whether it's been a teleconference or a video platform, but Clearly, in the last 90 days, everybody has been forced into that. So um, that's an opportunity to work around time constraints also. Now, when we go back into the world as to what it looks like, um, that's not going to go away. In person is going to come back. It, it always comes back to that individual. So um, my recommendation is if that school gives you a, a really hard line, um, one of the things that was the best strategy that I learned um, when my son first had his eligibility in 2005 was, can you show that to me in writing? I process things a lot better when I read them. And when you tell me I'm only allowed to do the window you say, that doesn't really seem fair, you know? And everybody's trying to work with the best of what they have. But by being, um, you know, they, there's this great book that a lot of us know about from emotions to advocacy, when we can remove the emotion from us, which is really hard as the parent, then our communication is a lot more collaborative. So like I said, if you are experiencing that frustrating part, reach out to, you know, your friend, a therapist, your partner, us as the parent training center, have your frustration with us, but then with the school, just bring them the facts of what you need. So I hope that helps, Joe. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Ann or, or Vicki, do you guys have anything to add to that? Actually, we do get a lot of um, calls about that issue also, where especially when you're at a crunch time, end of the school year, 
or the start of the school year and schedules are really tight or the annual dates coming up and the school is concerned that it's going to quote expire um, and they need to get this IEP drafted. And we've had families who've had that um, difficulty with scheduling their, their jobs are not as forgiving. And so we have you know, talked to our family, said be creative. You might be able to attend via phone. Now everyone's doing phone and, and Zoom and all of the other platforms. So it's working out a little more convenient in, in that aspect. So there's a silver lining to all of this. But um, parents are an important member and the meeting should not go forward without you. So we have had to sometimes be a little strict with that and say, you know what, we do not consent for the meeting to go forward without us and we need to come back because really and truly it needs to be um, scheduled at a mutually convenient time for all parties and that is the family included. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would just, I definitely agree. Um, you know, there's a reason why uh, in, in the law it lists as an integral member of the IP team parents and um, I would only add, you know, clarity is kindness here. So the earlier we can start communicating and planning for everybody's benefit when those meetings will occur, I think the, the better it will be for everyone's participation. I think also, Joe, just really quick, one of the things that I share with parents is um, the parent-teacher conference is integral. It's really, really important. So um, my son had his IEP from first grade all the way through senior when he was graduate. And even in his senior year, in the fourth quarter, in the fifth week of the quarter, I had his parent-teacher conference. And his teachers are like, Mrs. Walford, we're sick, we're, we're three weeks away, you know? And my son was like, really mom, really mom? Um, but if you have that um, intentional collaborative conversations each quarter and you pay attention to the progress reports that you get from your child's teacher in the school every quarter, when you move into that IEP meeting, you know, you've already got that communication and those relationships established. And, um, you know, it, it just speaks to having a more effective meeting. So the timing is very, very important part, but having those collaborative relationships, they're also really integral. So I just, I needed to throw that in there because I think it's an important tool um, for parents to know. Absolutely. Now, Anne, the next question is to you. Um, can I bring someone to my IEP meeting do I need to let the school know that I want to bring someone? Yes, you can bring anyone, um, any adult you choose to the IEP meeting. Um, that has uh, been a question that's been around and going for a long time. Um, you know, it's actually in Florida statute that you can bring um, any adult of your choosing and they are not prohibited to attend. One of the concerns that we've had um, kind of rolls into the, the second question. Um, do I have to tell them? So legally, there's no requirement that you have to tell them, but, and we all know what that but means, I'm gonna change the, set, the meaning of that. It really is best practice too, because if you wanna have a collaborative relationship and not do IEP by ambush, you want to be upfront with everyone. And it also helps them prepare um, logistically the room size. So if you're going to bring uh, more than one person, we have enough seating, we're in a large enough conference room. If someone's attending via telephone, we can have that all set up. It really is best practice. And I will tell you, um, it sets the tone for the meeting. So when we're involved in a matter um, We've already sent out notification that we're going to be attending the IEP meeting on behalf of the student and they're aware. But I know that a lot of the districts are very concerned when families bring advocates, especially if those advocates are attorneys and they would like to have their attorney represented at the meeting also. So there's really not, um, you know, having an advocate or an attorney doesn't mean you're moving down the road to litigation. It's actually, it helps families stay on track and it helps as Ali mentioned, that keep that emotional piece out of the meeting and keep it, you know, just focused on the child and what the child's unique needs are. So um, we always advise our families 
it's best practice to, to notify them, let them know this way they're prepared. And at the end of the meeting, you're gonna be asked to sign a document that states that you were not discouraged from bringing the person of your choosing to the meeting. So that's an important piece. And so um, if there is ever a time where you are discouraged, that's your moment where you could note that in there. Um, we have had a really good working relationship with many of the districts and have they've not um, discouraged, but I will tell you, in a former life, a uh, long, long time ago, there was an issue before, you know, where it came up and the family actually told me this and I was able to reach out to the school and resolve things. Because oftentimes the schools are a little taken aback by, oh, you know, we didn't know there was a problem. Why are you bringing somebody? So it's always good, um, I, as Ali mentioned before, to have those parent teacher conference meetings to kind of let things, you know, be known. We also say, if you're gonna to go to a meeting, ask that the documents that they're going to share at the meeting be given to you at least five days prior so you can review them and you're informed and you can have meaningful participation. I think transparency is really the key to keeping these collaborative relationships going between you and the IEP team, because ultimately we're all there for the student. So. There's not a side, although sometimes it feels like it when you get to the meeting and there's, you know, 17 school board members sitting there and, and you're and you're the, the one parent with your advocate, but it's really not. It really the focus needs to remain on the child. And so we would highly recommend that you notify them. And they cannot say, um, no, you can't bring your advocate, no, you can't bring an attorney. So it's best to be um, upfront. I would also add to that. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an advocate or an attorney that you can bring. You can also, a lot of families that we work with um, want to bring someone just for comfort and for support and emotional support. Um, so you can bring your partner, you can bring your neighbor, you can bring your, your mother, your tia, your whomever um, that's going to be that support system for you as well. Um, so I think that's good to, to point out. Um, I wanted to go ahead and welcome um, Dr. Monica Veritorato, um to the, the presentation. Um, welcome, Monica, and if you would just spend a, a quick moment to introduce yourself and your role. Certainly, I, I appreciate being able to, to join the group. My name is Monica Veritorato, and I currently serve as Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Exceptional Education and Student Services since 2012. Um, this is, I, gosh, must be my ninth time participating in Family Cafe and, and just so appreciative of, of the work that goes into ensuring that uh, good, relevant, solid information is made accessible to our families, to our students, and we're empowering persons with disabilities, both youth and adults, um, to become um, self-advocates. Uh, personally, I'm a, a mom myself, uh, four of my adult children. Um, I have four adult children, two of whom had IEPs when they were in school, so um, I wear and have worn both hats, and I was thinking about um, Anne's comment, and, and that, you know, even being, uh, when I was director of ESC in a, in a school district, at the time my children had IEPs, and as a parent, I was intimidated, just because it's my kid, ah, you know, so, uh, you know, so certainly it, it doesn't matter who you are, I mean, Anne, probably as an attorney, you know, just, it's like, if you're talking about my, my babies, <laughs> And, and uh, so, uh, so I, I, I thought those words that you shared were really important and, and to remind people that, and our school folks who are listening in today, that simply because someone's asking to bring someone, it's not, it's not that they're trying to, you know, set up an adversarial relationship. It's, it's, it's almost like when I say, hey, can someone come, I'm going to bring a friend or a family member to the doctor's appointment. I'm a little bit nervous about this. And I'll feel better if I have somebody else with me listening, making sure I remember questions I was going to ask, you know, uh, did you hear what I heard? <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. Uh, so can certainly relate to that. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Joe. Thank you for being our moderator today. Thank you. And uh, Monica, I will actually flip back to a question that we have for you, if you're all right with that. Yeah. Um, so the first few questions we had during the session were around COVID and how it's changed. Um, some of the landscape of special education here in the state of Florida and what we're doing to address and react to those changes. Um, so the question I have for you is, how has COVID changed special education? As an example, 
my child is medically fragile. Can they continue doing distance learning when the schools open again? That's a really good question. And of course, you know, there's so much uncertainty still. Yeah. We're learning about um, uh, where we are, governor's proclamation phase two, what that might mean for businesses and communities. But then, uh, for example, where Ann is in Broward and, and, and South Florida may not be in phase two yet. Um, to, so I'm saying all this to say the bottom line is our responsibility is to ensure that each child has a safe learning environment. And if that's in the school building, then we have to take the necessary precautions to ensure that that's happening. And if it needs to continue to be at home, um, then that needs to continue to be an option, whether it's through uh, this kind of rapid plan that we developed um, this spring to respond to all buildings being closed, or for some children for whom um, when school buildings reopen, it still may not be recommended by their doctor and their family that they return to a school building yet. And um, then we have provisions through hospital homebound, et cetera, to ensure that we're meeting their needs. So I think the most important thing is every family should feel, should feel reassured that the responsibility is that we meet each individual student's needs, including possible implications um, as it relates to folks, um, both kids and adults who may need special circumstances. That would apply to school employees as well. You know, we're gonna have to look at each individual person, child, in a unique case-by-case -case basis as we begin to, um, you know, reopen buildings. Wonderful. Thank you. Allie, the next question goes to you. Um, how valuable is, the, is parent input in general, and should I write it out ahead of time? Um, you know, I, I shared earlier that, you know, I started this journey in 2005 with my son as a parent. And it, I think that the parent input is really one of the most important parts of the IEP. So as you learn about the IEP and you learn about the present levels of performance and the goals and the related services and the supplemental services, this was my experience. In 2005, we had, you know, this eligibility meeting that I still wasn't entirely sure about. And this uh, ESD specialist or this LEA across the table from me said, so mom, tell me about your kiddo. And, and I was like, well, he does this and he does that. And, and, and it was all of those negativities, which we all already knew, which was why we were at the table. But we, I didn't know to share about his strengths and his abilities and the strategies. And um, as I evolved in this process, um, my county also started handing out a, just a little four question questionnaire that was the that was the parent input guide. Well, um, in this process, I, I think it's more than four questions that we need to, to, to answer. But when I'm working with parents, I will give them, it's actually 12 questions. And I'll say, hey, here's this Word document. I want you to type this out ahead of time. And I don't want you to answer more than three questions a day. And then part of it is going to be the letter that you never send. Because part of it's going to be all of that stuff that you're either angry or frustrated about. So then you have somebody kind of edit it out. So it truly distills down to all of that information that's going to really impact your child's education. Um, and then the, when you write it out ahead of time also, and you can save it and you can send it out to the team, that gives them an opportunity to look at it ahead of time. So like earlier, like Ann said about getting all of the documents five days ahead of time, if you can send your parent, your pro, um, parent input ahead of time also, that really saves some invaluable time at the IEP meeting. One of the earlier questions that we had was about um, being scheduled a specific window of time for a meeting. Well, also, a lot of districts are only going to schedule about an hour, an hour and a half. And you should be able to cover a great majority of your information during that time, but sometimes it'll take longer. So if you're using a huge chunk of that time to pull your thoughts together and talk about, oh, well, we're in fourth grade, but he only reads on first grade, or she's in seventh grade and her anxiety has her coming home with a stomach ache every other day. If you're spending all that time in the um, parent input section, 
face to face with everybody, you're losing some really valuable collaborative problem solving time. So to go back to your original question, Joe, um, as a, pom a mom and, and as a program director, I just parent input, it drives all of the work that, that I do. You know, I can't help the family if I don't help them understand their child. They can't help the school if they don't help the school understand the child. So it's much more than just a piece of paper. It's really how well do you know your child and can you advocate for your child? Wonderful, thank you. Now, Vicki, the next question comes to you. What is a safety plan? Do all students with IEPs have or need a safety plan built into their IEP? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, so the quick answer is no, not all students with IEPs have a safety plan. And a safety plan typically is a plan used to address specific behaviors that may be dangerous to the student and or others. And it's going to be developed based on individual student needs as determined by an IEP team. Um, I think um, associated plans and associated processes specific to behavior uh, that, that families may be familiar with are the behavior intervention plan, which is different than a safety plan, uh, which is uh, informed by a functional behavioral assessment, which is performed under very specific circumstances and is meant to give the team information about how to best support any behavioral needs for a student to, to help those be addressed interventionally. Wonderful. Thank you. The next question goes back to Monica. Um, Monica, why would the school do a threat assessment on my child if their behaviors are part of their disability? Is the IEP team part of a threat assessment team? Again, a very good question. Um, so threat assessments are conducted to determine whether or not a student poses um, a threat to him or herself or the others. Um, and, and that means, you know, a safety, you know, um, they may hurt themselves seriously or, or others. So all students, including students with disabilities, um, are part of the group of, of individuals that for whom if there was a, a threat that was made, either in, uh, verbally or in writing, um, need to be determined whether or not this is a credible threat. And that's to keep um, not, you know, not only other students safe, but the student themselves safe. Now, what's important to understand would be that there should be someone as part of that team as they're making the determination that understands the nature of the child's disability, but I think even more importantly understands the child's perhaps unique characteristics that are not necessarily a function of the disability, but are something that that child may be known to say or do. And so for example, I've, I've heard from families whose child, whose children have autism. And in one particular situation, this was a youngster who um, over the years has, um, verbally said, I want to kill myself or I want to kill other people. And um, the, the uh, parent um, felt, well, because my child has autism, um, and he said this in the past, that the school should not um, treat each situation um, as if to evaluate to see if, if indeed there's a possibility that this time it may actually be a legitimate threat. And, and I think this is a very difficult um, place to be because on the one hand, um, you need to know that these are known uh, things that are said. There should be a plan to address that, number one, because certainly transitioning into being a successful, productive adult would mean that if I don't really mean those things I'm saying, I'm learning not to. Because certainly in the workplace and in post-secondary, if I'm continually threatening to hurt myself or others, that's gonna be a barrier to successfully moving into um, being an adult. So that's, that's one thing. If that is a known thing, we need to be working on that. Meaning the kid really doesn't mean it, I just say it. So that should be, that should be addressed. Um, and then that will then help those members of the threat assessment team to really get a sense of, um, you know, quickly, is this a legitimate threat this time or not? 
Now, students with disabilities, students with all, a full range of disabilities um, are not uh, to, to, are not excluded from the possibility of hurting myself or hurting someone else, including um, completing suicide. And so I do worry sometimes, I've heard some folks say, no kid with a dis, um, I've actually said, I've seen an email that said, no kid with a disability should be assessed, you know, clearly it's part of their disability. And I think, okay, that suggests that they're, that students with disabilities are not also part of the group of young adults or young children, even it's becoming more and more of an issue at younger ages, who not only are thinking about committing suicide, completing suicide, but actually do. And so um, what would I suggest? My suggestion would be, um, and it really goes back to something that Vicki, you just touched on that safety plan, really understanding and knowing if this is something that the child has expressed over and over again, how are we getting down to the kind of, what is the function of why I'm expressing that? Um, and then ensuring that there is a plan so that um, we would know if this indeed had moved from something that I just say for attention seeking or that I have moved into potentially thinking about a plan um, to, to, to do this. So I, I don't have all the answers because each case is so unique. I do think this is an area that, you know, um, the folks like the folks who are on today, we need to continue to work with the mental health professionals, professionals in the field, uh, families to really make sure that we've got a good sense on this and we either don't under assess for possible threat and miss being able to intervene in the life of a young person or over and, and having children, you know, um, subjected to, um, you know, involuntary examinations when um, it wasn't necessary. Um, so, that's the answer and the bottom line here is it's be just make sure it's an individual decision you're engaging the family and those who know the child best to make these decisions wonderful thank you so much for that answer now the next question goes back to Anne. and can my child's private therapist rbt aba bcba provide services at the school during school hours? So the short answer is going to be yes. So back in, I want to say, um, not a great reporter of time, but 2011-ish, um, FND and Disability Rights Florida were involved in educating some of the legislators out there on some of these issues. And one, I remember particularly was this concern about private providers coming into the schools and assisting. And I know there was a lot of concern. I know a lot of school districts were, were, were very concerned that these people would come in and kind of take over the classroom. And there was, a, there was a huge concern that families in particular would send their quote babysitter or the person who was running their kids home program into the school and insist on working with the child. So when language was being um, drafted and reviewed, they tried to come up with this, um, and this is kind of the problem when you try to get so specific that um, there's no wiggle room. So they came up with a kind of a list of who could come in and who could specifically work in the classroom. And, and at that time, they were looking at behavior analysts. Um, it was well-defined, there was a definition in statute, and so behavior analysts became the person, and those certified under statute 393.17, you know, and that was it. So as we've evolved, and now there are RBTs out there, the, the, the debate has been, well, an RBT is not to the same level of education as a behavior analyst, so can they come in? And our response has been, there's nothing prohibiting the RBT from coming in the classroom and assisting. Now, ultimately, we all know the school district is responsible for the provision of a free and appropriate public education. And these extra services were not meant to supplant the school's obligation and responsibility under the IDEA. But since it takes a village, and I would think if somebody would like to come and help me do my job and make it easier for me to do my job more effectively, 
come on in. I will give you the address to my office once we reopen. Um, but in this case, yes, they can come in. They can work. It needs to be scheduled through the principal. And I think it's a really great idea. But remember, it's not in place of. And if that student needs those services to ensure a free and appropriate public education, the services should be delineated on the IEP and the student should be getting those services through the school. But if there's a shortage and there's a need and you have somebody who's working wonderfully with the student at home, I think it behooves all parties involved to allow that person to come in and work with the student so that that child is able to benefit from their education. Wonderful, thank you so much, Anna. Now, Ali, the, the next question looks at assistive technology and communication devices. Um, so my child uses a communication device at home, but the school does not have one for them. How do I address that? Yeah, that's a really good question. We get that one a lot too. So it seems like all of the big questions that bubble to the top are in today's hour long workshop. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, what I want parents to be aware of in um, IDA, Individuals with Disabilities Act, within the IEP, there's this thing called special factors. And there's special factors that have to be looked at at every single child that could potentially be found eligible for an IEP. So it's behavior, limited English proficiency, uh, blindness or visual impairment, um, communication needs, um, as well as deafness and assistive technology. So it's one of those special considerations that the team should be looking at already. Now, if your child is using a device at home, um, you would wanna share that information with the school district and perhaps you'd need to request an assistive technology evaluation. What you're using at home may not be accessible or not um, available from the school district. You know, so I know we've said individual a lot today, but for this particular question, it's, it's more true than ever. It's very much a, an individual issue with the school, the child, and um, bringing in possibly that evaluation team to look at what those needs are to provide that faith and that child's access to education. Wonderful. Vicki and Monica, do you guys have any thoughts on that one? Um, I agree. I think it's important. I think especially if the student is is really proficient in that device to bring that in so they have a meaningful method of communication in the school. And sometimes we've had where the family has actually come in and trained the staff on the device. And so that's been helpful. We've had other cases where, you know, they've trialed different devices, but really the device that the student is working on is already data to show that that's the device for, for that student. So it's really great to, again, have that family school collaboration. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Vicki, the next question's for you. My child has an IEP, can they be suspended? So, Yes, any student, uh, even if that student has a disability who violates the student code of conduct can be suspended, but there are some special rules that, um, and things that need to happen if the student has a disability. So for instance, if a student has a disability and, and is removed from the classroom environment for more than 10 consecutive days, then, then they need to get the IEP team together to meet to see if the behavior that's causing that suspension is a result of the student's disability or a failure to implement the IEP appropriately. Um, and I know some of, some of the audience may know this as a manifestation determination review meeting, MDR meeting, another acronym which Anne aptly talked about how much we love in education. <laughs> So um, it's also, I think, important to note that students with a disability who are suspended, they have a right um, to access educational materials and special education services during those suspensions as well. Wonderful, thank you. Monica, the next question is going to you. What should I expect at transition IEP? How is it different than before my child was 14? 
what does deferment mean? What exactly are deferment options? So there's a bunch. Of That's a lot. Things. Okay, but this is really important. So I, I think one of the most important things is that the whole transition process as we're preparing students um, to exit the K-12 school system is all about shifting and empowering that student to uh, become front and center of their IEP, of the decisions, the recommendations, really beginning to um, be, begin, be, be beginning to prepare to own that IEP um, as they are moving towards adulthood. That's, that's, that's one thing, and I, and I think we need to continue to do more of that, not just for kids with disabilities, but for all kids. Um, what we see in general students who exit our system um, who um, have not yet found their voice, and I think it's important that we make sure that they're finding their voice. But specifically, what is the law requiring? That we are ensuring that the plan that we're developing is aligned to measurable post-secondary goals that are gonna ensure that the child is able to reach those goals. So the child, we're getting the student's input, um, obviously the parent's input, but again, this is where the student's voice becomes the, the, the most important. What is it that I would like to be? I wanna be a teacher. Um, so what is it gonna take for me to become a teacher? You know, so what courses then do I need to take in high school? Making sure we're talking about that. That means I'm going to college, right? So what courses do I need to take to do that? Um, and then what support am I going to need in those courses? Are there other areas that I'm going to need support with related services? Perhaps I want to be a teacher and I have a visual impairment. What kinds of orientation and mobility needs am I going to have as I'm, again, preparing to transition to post-secondary? Um, and so um, that is is... I, I think fundamentally one of the, the, the most important um, uh, opportunities that we have for our, our students to really begin to get their voice and choice to guide that. Um, along, so the next question was around deferment. So in Florida, um, uh, several years back, I think it's about five or six years now, uh, became the option for students who meet graduation requirements and maybe they've met it within the four years, so now they're 18. Um, and, and, this is, and, and this is in general, but a lot of times these are students who've met their requirements within the four years, they're now 18 years old, um, but they really need the benefit of some of the more intensive supports that we can provide through the K-12 system to prepare them best for post-secondary um, uh, opportunities, whether that be independent living, um, community support, transportation, um, ongoing coursework, you know, there's a variety of, of things that our students need. And so if they defer receipt, they can stay on again until um, age 22 and receive those supports. Um, they can also leave be before that. I, we've had some students who defer and after a year say, you know, I'm ready to go ahead and take my diploma and, and move on to, my, to, the next, to the next stage of my life um, or stay for that entire time. And so um, it, it's, and it's not just students with the most significant disabilities, it's an individual uh, decision. And what I mean by that is obviously there's gotta be a need, but there's not a category to say this group of students with the most significant disabilities as defined by X, Y, Z, they can defer and no one else can even have the conversation. It's every student um, with a disability, um, the conversation should, sh uh, can and should be had. Um, and so, what was important about that, and Anne was actually at the table when that, I think, was um, became was a bill and then became a law, is that um, it allows um, our accountability system to continue to um, support um, that, you know, that graduation, timely graduation is a factor, a, a predicting factor for ensuring that we don't have kids drop out. So helping keep, make sure kids are continuing to move along in that progress is important. But then at the same time, um, ensuring that students who do need longer than the four years are afforded that opportunity. So I hope that answers the question. And if anyone want, else wants to jump in, feel free to do so. I would just wanna say something as a, a mom. I'm, I'm a large woman, I'm six foot one, but my son is six foot five. And he was six foot five when he was a freshman and he was 14. He did not want to be in his meeting. He just is not what he wanted to do. And so now when I work with parents, I'm like, it's really important that you encourage and nudge and empower that uh, youth to be part of their meeting. And really that can start as early as um, elementary school with those independent functioning goals. Like, 
what is self-advocacy? How do you self-advocate? And as the adults in the room, are we really listening to that child or youth yeah. when they advocate? I think that's a really important part. And that's how we get the youth to the table when they're 14. Allie, that's a great point. As a mom myself, that's one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't help my kids more in that when they would be nervous. I mean, that's okay. You know, cause that's what we do. I just jump in and I got it. That's it, you know, and, uh, and, and then they, later on, they're like, so what was that? Why did I have a case manager? Why did I have, <laughs> you know, I'm like, all right, I'm in charge of this stuff. And I didn't even, you know, so I, I think, I think, you know, it's, it's our inclination to want to protect. Right. And, and even for some of the teachers and, um, but at the same time, it really is their plan. It really is. And we've got to honor and respect that and, and help teach them if they're not ready yet then use that as a teaching moment. And I've, I've come, that, that's one of those things if I could do, you know, now again, now they're 30 and 28, I can't do, <laughs> um, I, would, I would have done more of that, yeah. And I think really too, Monica, I live in South Florida and um, you know, the, as professionals, we throw around that term cult cultural competency, but it's much more than that. My husband and his family, they're Jamaican and they have a very different relationship with education than my family did. And my Latino sisters that are down here, they, they, you know, they're going to jump in and take care of that like you did. So I think as the professionals, it's really important that we do do that empowering the process to the parents so they can do it with their children. And I have to agree, and I will have to admit that I've been guilty of that in the past too, but I think really empowering the, um, the student to make those choices is going to help them as they move on to post-secondary. And I also want to put in that shameless plug that right at these transition meetings, we need to have those third-party agencies present also so that they can help. Assist Good reminder. Them. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, just had to add that little third party agency part in there to make sure they're at the table because we all need to be planning and helping and advising so that youth has the ability to make those meaningful decisions based on proper information. Because I've seen a lot of IEPs where they have said to kids, um, the kid's post-secondary outcome is I wanna be an engineer, but we're never, we had not built to those steps. So it's really important for the student to be at the table so that student knows what those steps are going to be in order to be successful in, you know, moving on to, as Monica says, college or career ready. Yes. Now, I've got one more question to wrap up uh, this panel discussion. Um, Vicki, it's coming to you. What options do parents have when there is a disagreement with districts besides filing a state complaint? I love this question. And I think it speaks to a thread that ran through our discussion the entire time we were together. And, and that's the importance of partnership and, and, and having a good collaborative relationship. The better the collaboration, the better the outcomes. So I would say, first of all, reach out to school staff and district staff and, and you know, try to continue those discussions. But if it gets difficult, Call us. One of the main things we do here at the department is take parent calls and help facilitate those conversations but, uh, and, and the restarting of those because we know it can get difficult. Um, and, you know, our number, 850-245-0475, we have a 1-800 number uh, we can share out later. Um, the, the next step, of course, is you could ask for a facilitated IEP meeting. Um, we've been providing virtual since the start, since school closures. Um, as a state, and I know districts have been doing that as well. Sometimes having that other neutral third party there at those IEP meetings can help bring that emotion, just like Ali was saying, back out of it and help us all refocus on how to help that, that child do uh, and, and get what they need. Um, and of course, mediation always exists, that legally binding voluntary agreement between the parties. Um, and that those are really good alternate resolution options. Of course, you always retain the right to do state complaints or due process complaint, but I think the the more you can resolve uh, before that, the better you the, the better the relationship uh, kind of can be maintained and developed. Wonderful. And do Joe? Do I have time for for one last comment? You didn't ask, or you might have asked this question and I missed it. Go for it. One more comment. 
So this is this is in light of the impact of school building closures and our students moving to remote learning. I think I'd be remiss to not address this. Um, and so um, what I'm working with districts right now is what you should expect. And I, I, I've advised that this is what I will be communicating to families um, at, at such as Families Cafe is that um, ex extended school year in Florida, and we have a, and I can share the link to our um, guidance that, um, that has long existed, says that anytime the IEP team is, believes that there are some type of circumstances that if there is not additional services provided, it could potentially impact the faith. Um, and it includes, our guidelines in Florida include extraordinary circumstances, and it lists some things now, it doesn't list COVID-19, because I think when this was developed <laughs> years ago, there was, we didn't contemplate school building closures to COVID-19. We didn't know about murder wasps either. But <laughs> I, I think it was built in there to suggest there may come a time that there's going to be a need for a team to meet to say, you know, they're under these circumstances, these unique circumstances that are not always the typical things that people are thinking about each year when they're having those ESY meetings, but under the COVID-19, just by itself, that's an extraordinary circumstance. So it would be fair that every team and every parent say, as a result of school building closures and moving to remote learning, did, how did my child do? Some children may have done very well. So we can't assume that every child didn't do well. Other children may have done reasonably well, but there's some gaps and other kids that may really have struggled with the changes, with the things that were happening at home, families working at home, you know, you got everybody at home, you got grandma at home and everybody's in the, you know, trying to share, you know, devices. And so um, IEP teams, including parents should be asking this question. It, are there gaps that have occurred and let's develop a plan. And it may look different than in the past because this would be unique to COVID-19, meaning all fourth graders missed something to some degree at the end of fourth grade, as an example, and may need something different as they start fifth grade all. But for students with disabilities, what might that look like? And for our students, individual students, what would that look like? And so some of the conversations are beginning with summer programs this summer. Uh, again, depending, you know, uh, probably most will need to continue to be remote because they're, they're not um, released yet for opening buildings at this time but looking at, you know, uh, remediating, and I'm going to just pick fourth grade as a former elementary teacher, remediating some of those fourth grade skills, previewing some of those fifth grade skills, so that when I start fifth grade in the fall, uh, I'm feeling a little bit more confident in, in about what's coming up. And then, of course, those related services. So if I have got speech goals and language goals and those kinds of things, that, that there may have been some needs. And so, um, that is our messaging as we're working with parents, as parents are starting to call us to say, okay, now what? <laughs> What's next? You know, if I, I, I'm not sure my child is fine. What, what, what should happen next? It's going to be, let's have an IEP meeting. Let's meet and let's discuss. And extended school year services, by the way, are, as just a reminder, are not limited to the summer. They can and should be considered um, for throughout the school year. Why I'm talking about the summer is certainly we don't want to wait, if at all possible, if districts and schools are able to begin to offer um, some things. Now, I did talk to a parent uh, attorney the other day, and they said, well, some parents probably like this week may not be ready to get their kids back on remote learning today, but give them a couple weeks. <laughs> and if, if districts are offering and schools are offering some opportunities that they felt strongly, even if it needs to be remote, um, that would be beneficial to to the students and families that they, they represent. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. I know I've taken a little bit more time, but I think it's important that families know if you're concerned, that is that is a great way for you to address your child's gaps and develop a plan with a team in order to, to close any of those gaps through extended school year services, which summer and throughout the school year would be something to consider. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for bringing up that very important uh, point. Um, now, Bees has asked if uh, anyone has any questions that they would like answered um, to email ESCParentServices at FLDOE.org. I'll say that one more time, ESCParentServices at FLDOE.org, and they will get back to you with some answers. So I'm going to turn it back to the Family Cafe crew, and thank you all so much for joining us. 
All right, everybody, welcome back. Thanks very much, Joe, and thanks to all of our panelists today for providing some excellent information. Um, you might have noticed I've exchanged Lori for yeah. policy manager Joe McCann here at the Family Cafe. Welcome back, Joe. Thank you very much. A uh, couple of things I just want to remind you of before we close out our hour. First of all, if you have registered for the annual Family Cafe, you got one of our packets in the mail. Looks just like this. Within your packet, you'll find your report card to let us know how we're doing. And you'll find your pink card to submit questions and comments about Florida's service delivery system. Remember, if you send those back to you, we'll send you a free gift while supplies last, but make sure you include your return address. If you haven't registered and you'd like to get a packet in the mail, you still can. Just visit familycafe.net and the registration link is right up there on the homepage. So the last thing I wanna let you know is about what we have coming up at two o'clock. What's going on at two o'clock, Joe? Two o'clock, we have our session with our friends at Disability Rights on accessing the vote. We'll hear from, uh, we'll hear from Disability Rights on uh, voting access. Right, another important topic that I'm sure you all are eager to hear about. So please do come back at two o'clock and join us for that session. We'll see you then. Thank you.